Good morning. Good morning. That's what I like to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a saying. I used one this morning about Native Americans, and it goes like this. The earth belongs to all of our people, some of them living, some dead, but most have not yet been born. Most have not yet been born. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the bottom line of environmental stewardship, that we have an obligation to future generations. And that's what we'll be talking about today and how you can help make that happen and possibly get some business out of it. There was a gentleman by the name of Henry Ford who started Ford Motor Company in 1903, who was a real conservationist. He believed in using materials from the earth. He used hemp, he used soy. Uh, actually, he even used materials from New Orleans, and he was able to get the Spanish moss sold to him for five cents a pound. He used to tell them what kind of wooden boxes to put them in, and what they found out is he used that moss in seat covers, um, pardon me, seat cushions, and he used the wood for the dashboards. There was another company by the name of Timken. He ordered bearings from Timken, told them what kind of wood to use in the bearings. They laughed at him. Little did they realize that what happened is after he used the bearings, he took that wood and he used it for the floorboards and the Model Ts on the side of the Woody station wagons. That's what you've got to do. You've got to find a way to help the environment. Frankly, he found a way to reduce cost. But you help the environment and reduce cost. And that's what we're talking about. Now, a whole lot didn't happen at Ford Motor Company after Henry Ford until Bill Ford came along. Bill Ford is a strong believer in environmental stewardship. I had the opportunity to start working for him in 1990. I spent time in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Taiwan, India, all these countries forming joint ventures. Then he says, I've got a new job for you. I said, great, what is it? You're going to work on the environment. As an engineer with an MBA and never taken a course on the environment, I said, you got the wrong guy. What we got to do is find guys that really know that stuff. That's who you ought to use. He says, we have guys that know all that stuff. Unfortunately, I'm not proud of Ford Motor Company because all we do is fight environmental regulations. And when they become law, what do we do? We do the minimum requirement. That's not what my great-grandfather did. That's not what I want for my grandkids. Well, I told him to see if he could say some of that on film as we were in the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil. Maybe he still It always bothered me that Ford, uh, as a company, was seen as an environmental uh, bad guy, and that uh, Clearly, the auto industry over time had been part of the problem uh, that, that the world had faced environmentally. And I felt that it was very important that Ford get out in front of the issue and become part of the solution and become the leader in the environmental issues. Because really, it's something that you know doesn't only affect our lifetime, but it's something that, that our children, our grandchildren are, are, are going to be faced with. Uh, and uh, we created this mess for them, and uh, we better start cleaning it up. We created this mess for them. We have to clean it up. Can you imagine a guy whose name is on many, many, many buildings is saying, we're part of the problem. We need to be part of the solution. And that's what he was all about. So we're talking about sustainability. What is sustainability? Let's define it. Let's define it simply. Man, are there big definitions. Very simply, it's the ability of this generation to be able to produce whatever it wants out of the materials it wants but not sacrifice the ability of future generations to be able to do the same thing. It's that simple. So what do we got? We have a group that was formed. We called it the Recycling Action Team because there was way too much motion, not enough action. All of you working for companies know you attend a lot of meetings. We used to call it Ford Meeting Company. Well, it doesn't do you any good if you have meetings but nothing comes out of them. You don't do something concrete. And so that's what we're talking about. What we did with the Recycling Action Team is find a way. We said we, Ford, need to be using recycled materials if we want to help the industry. We need to use them, but we're not going to use materials unless they're as good as or better than the product we replace, because we're not going to sacrifice durability, quality, or reliability in the name of the environment. You don't do anybody any good if it falls apart. You also hit and hurt the environmental movement. I'm just doing this because I have this. Okay. Is it time? 
How much? Okay, welcome. Um, this session is getting your recycled resins approved for the automotive industry. Thank you, sir. Um, our first speaker is Andy Acho. Andy is a nationally recognized expert in practical environmental initiatives that help to make the world a better place and save money. Since retiring from Ford in 2006, he never retired, crying out. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Andy has become a valuable resource for organizations interested in protecting the environment and improving performance. Andy is also a contributing author to the book, Becoming a Green Innovator, Encouraging Green Business Practices. So to save time, I'm not gonna read the rest of your bio. <laughs> You're up. You can do it here? Yep. Okay, good. Thanks, Bill, good morning. I know we don't have quantity, but we have quality. Good morning. Good morning. That's what I like to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a saying, I used one this morning about Native Americans, and it goes like this. The earth belongs to all of our people, some of them living, some dead, but most have not yet been born. Most have not yet been born. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the bottom line of environmental stewardship, that we have an obligation to future generations. And that's what we'll be talking about today and how you can help make that happen and possibly get some business out of it. There was a gentleman by the name of Henry Ford who started Ford Motor Company in 1903 who was a real conservationist. He believed in using materials from the earth. He used hemp. He used soy. Uh, actually, he even used materials from New Orleans, and he was able to get the Spanish moss sold to him for five cents a pound. He used to tell them what kind of wooden boxes to put them in, and what they found out is he used that moss in seat covers, um, pardon me, seat cushions, and he used the wood for the dashboards. There was another company by the name of Timken. He ordered bearings from Timken, told them what kind of wood to use in the bearings. They laughed at him. Little did they realize that what happened is after he used the bearings, he took that wood and he used it for the floorboards and the Model Ts on the side of the Woody station wagons. That's what you've got to do. You've got to find a way to help the environment. Frankly, he found a way to reduce cost. But you help the environment and reduce cost. And that's what we're talking about. Now, a whole lot didn't happen at Ford Motor Company after Henry Ford until Bill Ford came along. Bill Ford is a strong believer in environmental stewardship. I had the opportunity to start working for him in 1990. I spent time in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Taiwan, India, all these countries forming joint ventures. Then he says, I've got a new job for you. I said, great, what is it? You're going to work on the environment. As an engineer with an MBA and never taking a course on the environment, I said, you got the wrong guy. What we got to do is find guys that really know that stuff. That's who you ought to use. He says, we have guys that know all that stuff. Unfortunately, I'm not proud of Ford Motor Company because all we do is fight environmental regulations. And when they become law, what do we do? We do the minimum requirement. That's not what my great-grandfather did. That's not what I want for my grandkids. Well, I told him to see if he could say some of that on film as we were in the Atlantic rainforest of Brazil. Maybe he's still it there. It always bothered me that Ford, uh, as a company, was seen as an environmental uh, bad guy. And that uh, clearly the auto industry, over time, had been part of the problem uh, that, that the world has faced environmentally. And I felt that it was very important that Ford get out in front of the issue and become part of the solution and become the leader in environmental issues. Because really, it's something that you know doesn't only affect our lifetime, but it's something that, that our children, our grandchildren, are, are, are going to be faced with. Uh, and uh, we created this mess for them, and uh, we better start cleaning it up. We created this mess for them. We have to clean it up. Can you imagine a guy whose name is on many, many, many buildings is saying, we're part of the problem. We need to be part of the solution. And that's what he was all about. So we're talking about sustainability. What is sustainability? Let's define it. Let's define it simply. Man, are there big definitions. Very simply, it's the ability of this generation to be able to produce 
whatever it wants out of the materials it wants, but not sacrifice the ability of future generations to be able to do the same thing. It's that simple. So what do we got? We have a group that was formed. We called it the Recycling Action Team because there was way too much motion, not enough action. All of you working for companies know you attend a lot of meetings. We used to call it Ford Meeting Company. Well, it doesn't do any good if you have meetings, but nothing comes out of them. You don't do something concrete. And so that's what we're talking about. What we did with the Recycling Action Team is find a way. We said, we Ford need to be using recycled materials if we want to help the industry. We need to use them, but we're not going to use materials unless they're as good as or better than the product we replaced because we're not going to sacrifice durability, quality, or reliability in the name of the environment. You don't do anybody any good if it falls apart. You also hit and hurt the environmental movement. Number two, it has to make financial sense. Read that to mean costless. I know you're thinking reduce your price. No. We wanted our suppliers and Ford Motor Company engineers to work together to find a way to reduce the cost in total so that the supplier makes more money and Ford gets a lower price. That's the only way it's going to work. Let me tell you the one area that didn't need help, and that's those of you in the metals industry, because we used a lot of recycled metals. This program is funded by Ford Motor Company. Our new vehicles are made with more than 2 million tons of recycled metals, enough to build 250 Eiffel Towers a year. Ford Motor Company. Better ideas, driven by you. Metals didn't need any help, but plastics and rubber did when you're starting in 1990. Not everyone was supportive, including within the Ford Motor Company, our own engineers. I remember with Tony Brooks and others going to a chief engineer and saying, we've created a part made out of plastic, recycled that we want to use on your Taurus. So I don't want to use that crap. Whoa, 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 no, this material meets or exceeds your standards. The stuff I have meets my standards. Why do I need to do anything else? I said, what if it saves you money? Oh, and meet my standards? Yeah, so we proved it to them, and that was really the beginning. But I want to tell you a little bit about at least four success stories. Before I do that, I'm telling you how difficult it is to get things done, because everybody fought us along the way, and I like Hannibal's saying when he was told he couldn't cross the Alps, and the statement was, I'll find a way, or I'm going to make one. And that's what we really did. So one of the first things we did is try to find somebody who had recycled plastic. We didn't have it from GE, Dow, DuPont, and some of the others. So we asked our engineers to look, and they found KW Plastics in Troy, Alabama, a gentleman by the name of Kenny Rogers, uh, Kenny Rogers, uh, Kenny Campbell, and uh, they had recycled plastic from batteries. So I said, let's buy from him. He said, well, we can't do that. He's not a Q1 supplier. Well, let's, let's make him a Q1 supplier. Well, that's a couple years. No, 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 we got to have action. Well, I said, well, we could go down there and spend time. In a matter of two, three months, he was a Q1 supplier. And we were able to give him an order right then for that first year for 6 million pounds. Since then, we have used 425 million pounds of recycled plastic from Kenny Campbell's company, just Ford Motor Company. 425 million, it's tough to kind of visualize. So what I did is I looked at what elephants weigh, African elephants, Asian elephants, female, male, add to four weights, divided by four, and you end up, the amount that we kept from going to landfills would be the equivalent of 34,500 elephants. How much is that? That is the equivalent of a line of elephants going from Birmingham, Alabama to Atlanta, Georgia. And if we were doing it here in uh, New Orleans area, we can go from here to Baton Rouge to Lafayette. Here's one I'm really proud of because we have one of the architects of this. We went to a company called Wellman. They were producing nylon. And we said to them, can't you give us recycled nylon from carpets? Well, they worked on it, and there was a gentleman by the name of Dean Chinduri, 
Dean, raise your hand. He led a team that found a way to be able to help us get recycled nylon from old carpeting, and we were able to do air cleaner housings and fan shrouds. Just that one project, two parts, was enough savings of 27 million square feet of old carpeting that didn't go to landfills and would cover three-fourths of the New York City Central Park. Or in Italy, I told them that we could cover Vatican Square five times, in China, Tiananmen Square five times. Just with that, of course, we've gone quite a bit beyond that. Because this is an SPE session, I thought you might like to know that SPE gave us an award for an environmental achievement. Quick story, my wife Dee is here. As I was getting dressed to go to the SPE session with 2,000 engineers, tuxedo, and she said, why do you have a tuxedo on? I said, well, I'm going up there and receiving an award on behalf of Ford. She says, why are you getting the award? I said, well, they've asked me to come up. Well, what's the award do? Do? I said, an award doesn't do anything. She says, now I know why you're getting it. Anyway, true? No, okay. Uh, one last story, protective seat covers. Uh, we were able to work with a company called Petaskey Plastics. They found a way to put the recycled plastic in between two virgin layers of plastic, and we saved, one, just this last year through December 31st, 1.2 million pounds, which is more than enough to go back and forth between LA and New York. Um, how many times? Quite a few times, 10 times, and Detroit to Key West 20 times. Plastic pop bottles, and I apologize for using terms like plastic pop bottles for this group. It's a polyethylene terephthalate. We use 50 million of them, and this is one that got me in trouble with Coca-Cola. By Ford Motor Company, each year parts for our new vehicles are made from more than 50 million recycled soda bottles, enough to cover a 400-acre lake shore to shore. Ford, dedicated to protecting the environment. They thought I was showing pop bottles create a problem. Went to their chairman, who went to our chairman because he was on our board. I got to meet with Coca-Cola's chairman, convinced him that it wasn't showing plastic pop bottles causing a problem, but recycling is causing a solution. He bought it, I got off the hook. Anyway, uh, in total we did a lot of other things, computer housings, telephone cases. Uh, we used a lot of different materials and tires we'll get into because there are 300 million tires roughly each year that are thrown away or retired. And uh, we didn't do much in the automotive industry for them. However, we ended up with an opportunity some time back to be able to collect eight to 10 million tires, find a home for them, make sure that they didn't end up in landfills. What we did is we had them cut up into chunks, frozen with liquid nitrogen until they become like glass, shatter them into millions of pieces, a magnet pulls out the metal, air blows off the fiber, and what's left is rubber. What do you do with that rubber? Well, when you've got, let's say, eight or 10 million and you've got roughly 12 pounds of rubber per use tire, you're looking at 100 million pounds. There wasn't enough of a market to be able to sell all that, so we did a deal where we, Ford, made donations to nonprofit organizations so they could use the recycled rubber, uh, rubber and be able to create a demand. This was the help of the EPA and the Federal Highway Administration. It was used for all kinds of things, football fields, soccer fields, running tracks, therapeutic riding arenas. It was used for roads. Therapeutic riding arenas is my favorite because the horses walk around in a circle on this rubber, makes them calmer. They take physically and mentally handicapped kids for therapy, and something about a horse's gait does something to a kid's spine, and we were able to find from mothers, after several years of this, the kids are able to walk, some kids are able to walk. I want to go beyond the regular mulch and all of that stuff that's used for rubber with a company I'm familiar with, and Bill Schreiber is much more familiar with, Nestle High Technologies out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, what they do is they go way beyond the normal recycling. They're probably one of the biggest users of uh, liquid nitrogen anywhere. And what they do is they make micronized rubber, very fine powder, and the thing I'm proudest of is they have 400 million tires today 
that have their rubber in it. In tires, six of the top 10 tire manufacturers use their materials, even though you haven't seen that advertised and promoted. Now, to meet with Coca-Cola's chairman, convinced them that it wasn't showing plastic pop bottles causing a problem, but recycling is causing a solution. He bought it, I got off the hook. Anyway, uh, in total we did a lot of other things, computer housings, telephone cases. Uh, we use a lot of different materials and tires we'll get into because there are 300 million tires roughly each year that are thrown away or retired and uh, we didn't do much in the automotive industry for them. However, we ended up with an opportunity some time back to be able to collect eight to 10 million tires, find a home for them, make sure that they didn't end up in landfills. What we did is we had them cut up into chunks, frozen with liquid nitrogen until they become like glass, shatter them into millions of pieces, a magnet pulls out the metal, air blows off the fiber, and what's left is rubber. What do you do with that rubber? Well, when you've got, let's say, eight or 10 million, and you've got roughly 12 pounds of rubber per use tire, you're looking at 100 million pounds. There wasn't enough of a market to be able to sell all that, so we did a deal where we, Ford, made donations to nonprofit organizations so they could use the recycled rubber, uh, rubber and be able to create a demand. This was with the help of the EPA and the Federal Highway Administration. It was used for all kinds of things, football fields, soccer fields, running tracks, therapeutic riding arenas. It was used for roads. Therapeutic riding arenas is my favorite because the horses walk around in a circle on this rubber, makes them calmer. They take physically and mentally handicapped kids for therapy and something about a horse's gait does something to a kid's spine. And we were able to find from mothers after several years of this, the kids are able to walk, some kids are able to walk. I want to go beyond the regular mulch and all of that stuff that's used for rubber with a company I'm familiar with and Bill Schreiber is much more familiar with, Nestle High Technologies out of uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, what they do is they go way beyond the normal recycling. They're probably one of the biggest users of uh, liquid nitrogen anywhere. And what they do is they make micronized rubber, very fine powder, and the thing I'm proudest of is they have 400 million tires today that have their rubber in it. In tires, six of the top 10 tire manufacturers use their materials, even though you haven't seen that advertised and promoted. Now, many of you are in the metals. I want to tell you, 60% of an average automobile is metals. You know, you've got an automobile with 40,000 parts, a thousand different materials, metals make up something like 60%. And even though we're pushing for a lot of recycling, a lot of reuse, I want to make, let you know there's still a home for metals. What about future material needs? I asked General Motors, what can I present to this group? And I went to their sustainability group. And here's what they said. And for those of you that were in my morning presentation, this was not part of it. So these are the different materials that they use that are bio-based. And on vehicle recyclability, they're looking on average to have 85% of their vehicle recyclable and 95% recoverable. And that's generally in the automotive industry. In addition to that, they're really emphasizing being land free. They have 152 facilities of which 100 manufacturing facilities are land free. Why are they doing that? It's good business, not just good for the environment, again, good for the bottom line, which I like to emphasize. So they have a billion dollars worth of revenue each year in most recent years. So they're accomplishing quite a bit. 2.5 million tons of waste are recycled each year. So I think that's kind of cool. How about uh, FCA, that's Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, it used to be known as Chrysler. Now they have a philosophy of design for life vehicles, emphasis is on environmental footprint. Reducing your footprint is what they want and they want to do it by recovery and uh, looking for end of life use of vehicles. What are their priorities? Increasing the use of renewable and recyclable materials in the next generation. Meeting or exceeding European targets. They are a little stricter than we are. 
and they want to develop automotive uh, applications for bio-based carbon. Ford's sustainability strategy is, again, increasing the use of recycled materials, plant-based renewables, eliminating substances of concern, addressing end-of-life impacts, working with socially and environmentally responsible companies, and that's on a global basis. Bill Ford was extremely proud when I introduced him on uh, March 22nd and said one of the things that Ford has accomplished is it has, for the eighth year in a row, been named one of the most ethically responsible companies in the world. And that's what he said he's aiming for. So anyway, they're continuing to work on closed loop. By closed loop, we're not talking about, you know, cradle to grave, it's cradle to cradle. Just an overview of sustainable material research that's going on. Uh, Bill and I have met with Ford quite a few times about some of this stuff. And this is the success that they've had with renewable materials. You can look at it and see it covers a whole lot of base. Additionally, here's what's emerging. They're talking about all kinds of alloys, ceramics, carbon fiber, nanotechnology. There's a lot going on. But the future material needs this, I think you might want to note, anything that reduces the weight of a vehicle. Why? That improves fuel economy. Why is that important? Because it's getting tougher and tougher to make better and more fuel efficient vehicles without spending billions of dollars. You want to reduce corrosion because what you want to do is have vehicles that last longer. You want anything that improves the manufacturing throughput, anything that reduces cost for everybody. And again, keep in mind volatile organic compounds. I'm throwing this in because of the fact that some of you are in the business that might be interested. Ford Motor Company's campus in Dearborn, Michigan has something like 2,400 acres. We have 70 facilities, and they're getting old. Plus, if you want to attract young people to your company when you've got the Googles and the Apples and the others, you've got to make sure that they work in an environment. They can stand up at any level. They can work. They can get around. They don't have to drive from building to building to go to meetings and that kind of stuff. So. The reason this is important for you, it's a 10-year transition and Ford lands priorities because Bill Ford has said the environment is one of the major aspects of what we're doing. And by the way, we're talking about a billion dollar renovation. We're talking about having green and high-tech campus. We're talking about moving 30,000 employees from 70 buildings to two campuses. There's a world headquarters campus where I spent a lot of my career, but not all of it and there's a product development campus. So we have our engineers, scientists, and all the rest of that. I want to give you uh, the transformation that objective specifically that might be of interest to you. They want to uh, aggressively use, first of all, they want to aggressively recycle the materials that they're tearing down. They want to use a lot of recycled materials. They want to get the facilities to be as high as possible in leadership and engineering and environmental design, and they want to achieve both water reduction and energy reduction to the tune of 50%. My final recommendations are this. When you go to sell, make sure the recycled product is as good as or better the product that you're replacing. Make sure you get that across. Number two, the product has to make financial sense, and I already explained what that means. Here's a thing that people forget. Streamlining the approval process for the engineers, purchasing, and suppliers. You know, you'd, one engineer is going to have a difficult time selling a product because they have to work with purchasing. They have to work with the suppliers. They have to work with their own team to make sure something is approved. So therefore, help make that happen. Find suppliers that are already approved by this company because normally the materials you're going to have are going to be a tier two. So you're going to sell to a supplier who sells it to Ford, GM, Chrysler. That's important. You also want to sell to the champions of sustainability. By that I mean find somebody that already knows it's good to be able to use recycled materials that meet or exceed their standards. Hopefully all of them do, but practically I don't think that's how it works. And Finally, 
Don't sell it only because it's green. Sell it because it's good business. I want to leave you with a couple things, one message and one of a little bit of humor. The message is this. Bill Ford believes that the difference between a good company and a great company is this. A good company offers excellent products and services. A great company not only offers excellent products and services, but strives to make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us have to find a way to do that. And let me show you that we're not the only ones that are interested in recycling. I had to go to Germany to get approval to use this. Okay, so it's 3708, okay. uh, paper plastic. Plastic. That's the magic word. What? Green police. <laughs> you picked the wrong day to mess with the ecosystem, plastic boy. Green plastic. Battery! Battery. Let's go, take the house. Come on. Put the rind down. Sure. That's a compost in Berkeley. Let's go. Uh oh. Did you install these bulbs? Well, tragedy strikes tonight where a man has just been arrested for possession of an incandescent light bulb. What do you guys think about plastic bottles now? The water setting is at 105. You got a TDI here? Clean diesel. You're good to go, sir. Are those foam cups you're drinking from? Yeah. Can we please step out of the car and put them on the hood? I thought you might enjoy that. Audie gave me permission to be able to use it. I want to thank you very much for your attention. You have a lot of great speakers, and hopefully you'll get something out of this. Action, not motion. Thank you. All right, good morning, um, afternoon. Oh, five minutes of morning. Um, I always appreciate, and at the same time, I'm a little intimidated when I'm at the same conference as Ford. Um, Many of you are in the metals. I want to tell you, 60% of an average automobile is metals. You know, you've got an automobile with 40,000 parts, 1,000 different materials. Metals make up something like 60%. And even though we're pushing for a lot of recycling, a lot of reuse, I want to make, let you know there's still a home for metals. What about future material needs? I asked General Motors, what can I present to this group? And I went to their sustainability group. And here's what they said. And for those of you that were in my morning presentation, this was not part of it. So these are the different materials that they use that are bio-based. And on vehicle recyclability, they're looking on average to have 85% of their vehicle recyclable and 95% recoverable. And that's generally in the automotive industry. In addition to that, they're really emphasizing being land free. They have 152 facilities of which 100 manufacturing facilities are land free. Why are they doing that? It's good business, not just good for the environment, again, good for the bottom line, which I like to emphasize. So they have a billion dollars worth of revenue each year in most recent years. So they're accomplishing quite a bit. 2.5 million tons of waste are recycled each year. So I think that's kind of cool. How about uh, FCA, that's Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, it used to be known as Chrysler. Now they have a philosophy of design for life vehicles, emphasis is on environmental footprint. Reducing your footprint is what they want and they want to do it by recovery and uh, looking for end of life use of vehicles. What are their priorities? Increasing the use of renewable and recyclable materials in the next generation. 
meeting or exceeding European targets. They are a little stricter than we are, and they want to develop automotive applications for bio-based carbon. Ford's sustainability strategy is, again, increasing the use of recycled materials, plant-based renewables, eliminating substances of concern, addressing end-of-life impacts, working with socially and environmentally responsible companies, and that's on a global basis. Bill Ford was extremely proud when I introduced him on uh, March 22nd and said one of the things that Ford has accomplished is it has, for the eighth year in a row, been named one of the most ethically responsible companies in the world. And that's what he said he's aiming for. So anyway, they're continuing to work on closed loop. By closed loop, we're not talking about, you know, cradle to grave. It's cradle to cradle. Just an overview of sustainable material research that's going on. Uh, Bill and I have met with Ford quite a few times about some of this stuff. And this is the success that they've had with renewable materials. You can look at it and see it covers a whole lot of base. Additionally, here's what's emerging. They're talking about all kinds of alloys, ceramics, carbon fiber, nanotechnology. There's a lot going on. But the future material needs this, I think you might want to note. Anything that reduces the weight of a vehicle. Why? That improves fuel economy. Why is that important? Because it's getting tougher and tougher to make better and more fuel efficient vehicles without spending billions of dollars. You want to reduce corrosion because what you want to do is have vehicles that last longer. You want anything that improves the manufacturing throughput, anything that reduces cost for everybody. And again, keep in mind volatile organic compounds. I'm throwing this in because of the fact that some of you are in the business that might be interested. Ford Motor Company's campus in Dearborn, Michigan has something like 2,400 acres. We have 70 facilities, and they're getting old. Plus, if you want to attract young people to your company when you've got the Googles and the Apples and the others, you've got to make sure that they work in an environment. They can stand up at any level. They can work. They can get around. They don't have to drive from building to building to go to meetings and that kind of stuff. So. The reason this is important for you, it's a 10-year transition and Ford lands priorities because Bill Ford has said the environment is one of the major aspects of what we're doing. And by the way, we're talking about a billion dollar renovation. We're talking about having green and high-tech campus. We're talking about moving 30,000 employees from 70 buildings to two campuses. There's a world headquarters campus where I spent a lot of my career, but not all of it and there's a product development campus. So we have our engineers, scientists, and all the rest of that. I want to give you uh, the transformation that objective specifically that might be of interest to you. They want to uh, aggressively use, first of all, they want to aggressively recycle the materials that they're tearing down. They want to use a lot of recycled materials. They want to get the facilities to be as high as possible in leadership and engineering and environmental design, and they want to achieve both water reduction and energy reduction to the tune of 50%. My final recommendations are this. When you go to sell, make sure the recycled product is as good as or better the product that you're replacing. Make sure you get that across. Number two, the product has to make financial sense, and I already explained what that means. Here's a thing that people forget. Streamlining the approval process for the engineers, purchasing, and suppliers. You know, you'd, one engineer is going to have a difficult time selling a product because they have to work with purchasing. They have to work with the suppliers. They have to work with their own team to make sure something is approved. So therefore, help make that happen. Find suppliers that are already approved by this company because normally the materials you're going to have are going to be a tier two. So you're going to sell to a supplier who sells it to Ford, GM, Chrysler. That's important. You also want to sell to the champions of sustainability. By that I mean find somebody that already knows it's good to be able to use recycled materials that meet or exceed their standards. 
Hopefully all of them do, but practically, I don't think that's how it works. And finally, don't sell it only because it's green. Sell it because it's good business. I want to leave you with a couple things, one message and one of a little bit of humor. The message is this. Bill Ford believes that the difference between a good company and a great company is this. A good company offers excellent products and services. A great company not only offers excellent products and services, but strives to make the world a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us have to find a way to do that. And let me show you that we're not the only ones that are interested in recycling. I had to go to Germany to get approval to use this. Okay, so it's 3708, okay. uh, paper or plastic? Plastic. That's the magic word. What? Green police. <laughs> you picked the wrong day to mess with the ecosystem, plastic boy. Battery! Battery! Battery. Let's go, take the house, come on! Put the rind down! Sir, sure. that's a compost infraction! Whoa! Oh. Did you install these bulbs? Well, tragedy strikes tonight where a man has just been arrested for possession of an incandescent light bulb. What do you guys think about plastic bottles now? The water setting is at 105. Yeah. Got a TDI here? Clean diesel. You're good to go, sir. Are those foam cups you're drinking from? Yeah. Can we please step out of the car and put them on the hood? I thought you might enjoy that. Audie gave me permission to be able to use it. I want to thank you very much for your attention. You have a lot of great speakers, and hopefully you'll get something out of this. Action, not motion. Thank you. All right, good morning, um, afternoon, oh, five minutes of morning. Um, I always appreciate, and at the same time, I'm a little intimidated when I'm at the same conference as Ford. Um, I work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, it's Toyota's uh, R&D headquarters for North America. Um, of course, that's right down the street from where Ford is headquartered. So I used to think that Toyota and Ford were competitors. Um, of course, we are. But uh, when it comes to sustainability and the green story, um, I've had very good relationships with Ford engineers and um, the people at Ford, and I have, have come to this consensus that we're not competitors when it comes to these technologies and these materials because really we all want the same end goal, right? Um, the auto companies have a long history of benchmarking each other and benchmarking each other and benchmarking each other. So inevitably, if a good technology exists, the other OEMs are going to have it five years later. Um, so for me personally, um, on a human level, I just want these materials to succeed. It doesn't matter who has them first. We all need to work cumulatively to spread this message to get to our suppliers uh, of parts and materials to make sure that um, we get this done. So my name is Eric Cannell. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Bill. Um, I have worked on various materials at Toyota uh, for just over a decade. Um, oh, thanks. Um, so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about Toyota's commitment to the environment and society, and then ultimately how it relates to the people in this room who are hopefully looking at understanding how they can get recycled materials in vehicles. What I kind of like about um, this slide, my first slide. I work in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, it's Toyota's uh, R&D headquarters for North America. Um, of course, that's right down the street from where Ford is headquartered. So 
I used to think that Toyota and Ford were competitors. Um, of course we are, but uh, when it comes to sustainability and the green story, um, I've had very good relationships with Ford engineers and um, the people at Ford and I have, have come to this consensus that we're not competitors when it comes to these technologies and these materials because really we all want the same end goal, right? Um, the auto companies have a long history of benchmarking each other and benchmarking each other and benchmarking each other. So inevitably, if a good technology exists, the other OEMs are gonna have it five years later. Um, so for me personally, um, on a human level, I just want these materials to succeed. It doesn't matter who has them first. We all need to work cumulatively to spread this message to get to our suppliers uh, of parts and materials to make sure that um, we get this done. So my name is Eric Cannell. Um, thanks for the introduction, Bill. Um, I have worked on various materials at Toyota uh, for just over a decade. Um, oh, thanks. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about Toyota's commitment to the environment and society and then ultimately how it relates to the people in this room who are hopefully looking at understanding how they can get recycled materials in vehicles. What I kind of like about um, this slide, my first slide, it's not the only one. Um, Toyota has this dream art contest every year. People all over the world can draw what they envision the future of cars to be. And I found this one. Um, this is from 2014, and this is obviously a child's concept of what a future car will be, taking all this stuff, a uh, car being fueled by glass, metal, paper, plastic, and uh, cleaning the environment at the same time. So it's kind of a neat way to start. I'm talking about four things. What is Toyota's motivation to do this? Um, what are we doing for recycled materials? Third, I'm going to show you a video about easy to dismantle design, and I'm going to summarize, of course. This is something that we see around our office. I think it's kind of one of those corporate pictures that probably took a huge amount of time for somebody to develop, but I want to summarize it for you. So Toyota believes that uh, it's important to have a strong base of business, which is kind of the trunk of this tree. What that means is we need to be profitable in the long term, right? At the same time, having that stable base does no good unless we can grow these fruits on our tree. These fruits on our tree are what we call always better cars and then enriching lives and communities. So at no time do we want to wait too heavily to growing fruit or do we want to wait too heavily on growing this tree. So ultimately, we always go back to our roots, the Toyota uh, principles, the Toyota way um, to help us grow our business sustainably and to continue to provide for society. All right, I'm going to talk about the 2015 recycling vision. Why am I talking about that? It's 2017, I know. This was established in 2003. This is kind of some background. Um, for those of you who have seen me speak before, this used to be what I would say, oh, this is coming in 2015. Well, the good news is um, it is achieved. So I do want to point out that this is a goal that was there in place when I started at Toyota, and we wanted to realize a 95% vehicle risk recovery rate, and we wanted to do a lot of other things. So including things like using recycled materials and using renewable resources at the bottom. So achieved. So after that ended, um, there are our next steps. There is something called the Six Toyota Environmental Action Plan. That's happening right now. So it started in uh, fiscal year 16 and it's going through 2020. But there's more beyond that as well. This is all going into what we're corporately calling the Toyota Environmental Challenge 2050. There are some pretty lofty goals for 2050. This is, I'm sure you can read it because I can, um, 26 individual activities that are to be implemented during this four-year period in order to accomplish and move towards this Environmental Challenge 2050. I know you can't see this either, but there are six goals of the Environmental Challenge 2050. A lot of them have to do with zero net CO2 emissions. So whether it be zero net CO2 during a production of a vehicle, driving the vehicle, end of life of the vehicle, um, or things like water conservation during manufacturing of the vehicle. And then number six is just challenge of establishing, establishing a future society in harmony with nature. I like that one. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of these today. The first is number three, promote environmental management and product development. All right, this is small. I'm going to go through this in a second. So what do we do when we're making a car, and how do we focus on the environment during the design and development of a car? So about five years before a car comes out, 
we have you know, big meetings with chief engineers and our designers and uh, studios about people who you know, want to have the car fly. And basically, we all sit down together and say, who's the demographic of this car? What do we want this car to do? Is it a fast car? Is it a family car? Um, but ultimately, one of the considerations is always balancing environmental performance. So we look at the customer need, but at every stage of the design and the concept, we're also considering how is this car going to impact the environment. So fortunately, at Toyota, we have a pretty large portfolio of hybrid vehicles. But obviously, hybrids are not the end game, right? There's a lot of other things that are being considered now, like electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. So all of these things are taken into consideration during the design of the vehicle. The next stage is two to three years, let's say, before a vehicle hits the road. This is the design and prototyping phase. So we've already had our meetings with the chief engineers. Um, the, there's agreement about what this car is going to do, but we start making prototype parts. We start working with our suppliers more aggressively. We have drawings with requirements on them. At this point, we are also heavily involved with making sure that that vehicle has what we need in terms of uh, environmental impact. And then finally, just before the start of production, we have a final verification. So this is something as simple as, for example, checking full vehicle VOCs, check for volatile, volatile organic compounds. Make sure that that information is available to our customers and to the public from a, from a sustainability standpoint um, and from a, a, a transparency standpoint. So one of the things that I like, and every couple of years I remember to look at this, um, is our ToyotaGlobal.com sustainability. All of our sustainability reports are available for anybody to look at. You don't have to have bought a Toyota. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, recycled resin, because that's what we're here for. Um, this is number 10, reduce consumption of dwindling natural resources through use of renewable resources and recycled material. For years at Toyota, all I did was, well, not all I did, one of my main jobs was working on um, renewable content materials. So I looked at all sorts of, um, I appreciated the slide with the jute and the hemp and the soy and the castor. Those are all materials that are kind of industry-wide now. I've also looked at recycled materials pretty extensively. So I'm not going to cover the renewables at all in this presentation. If you have any questions, obviously ask me afterwards. I thought what I would do is talk about two personal case studies of parts that I personally worked on for recycled materials to kind of give you an idea about um, if you were here in the last session or you were even here just five minutes ago, um, you heard how good the story is for recycled material, right? We're hearing that the quality is good and the price is good. So why aren't recycled materials being used for everything? Well, here's two case studies. All right, it's a good, in, good candidate part. It's interior, uh, so maybe the weathering requirement is quite as much. It's hidden, so we often hear in the recycled world that black is black. Um, well, I can tell you that black is not black, um, but this part was hidden, so black could be black for this. It could be a slightly different black than Toyota's 201B, which is our color code for our interior. It's currently an unfilled polypropylene. Um, with unfilled polypropylenes, there's a huge availability of recycled materials. Great news is there was 10 cents per vehicle savings. So why did I not do this? Well, there was a mass increase of 7%. So we looked at the huge portfolio of recycled materials that were available. At the time, we couldn't find any that gave us a, a mass neutral solution. Why is that happening? Because when you're looking at recycled materials, it's infrequent, especially with polypropylene, that you have a single stream source of raw material. So what happens is the compounders are taking your yogurt cups and your uh, laundry baskets and your laundry tubs and all these other types of plastics, automotive parts, blending them together. The color is off, so they add carbon black, or the properties are off, so they add more talc. They might add calcium. All of that increases the density of the material. So unfortunately, at Toyota, we have a policy that we shouldn't be increasing mass. Case number two. Another good candidate part. This is also interior. Uh, this is TPO. So Sue talked about TPOs earlier. Um, TPOs are more expensive than polypropylene. This is a customer touch surface, which I want to point out only because we kind of like the story of customers being able to get in contact with the material. So if we say this is a recycled instrument panel, the customer can touch it and, and feel at one with the recycled instrument panel. This is even more awesome than previously, right? So we've got almost a dollar savings per vehicle. So what happened? Well, what happened was the part had to have virgin properties. Um, it was the safety part. So this safety part, when we go to a designer or to a chief engineer, 
they say, well, lot-to-lot -lot consistency is absolutely critical to this part. We have to go to the government and say, we are confident that this part will perform the exact same way every single time. So um, at Toyota, there's a Japanese word, baratsuki, means variability. And whenever I start talking to my colleagues in Japan about um, recycled material, they always say, how's the baratsuki? <laughs> how's the variability? How's the lot-to-lot -lot variability? And I appreciated you mentioning KW. Because KW is not just a battery recycler um, that has some plastic. They are a gigantic recycler. Um, the first time I went to KW, I expected to see you know, a mom and pop shop with you know, a few little silos. But we are talking massive, massive, massive. It, takes, it would take you half an hour to walk around these things type of silos. They're putting more plastic through their facility than a lot of our automotive compounders are. So when you talk lots to lot variability, I think Sue mentioned the same thing this morning, that you know, ultimately you have raw materials coming in, whether it be petroleum or ethylene or now natural gas that's being cracked. Um, you have a raw material. And when you're dealing with that much volume and that much bulk, the variability starts to become less of a story. But there's still an issue of convincing the industry that recycled material doesn't have this issue. So when we talk about safety parts, there is a perception that exists that recycled material is no good. When I first started at, at Toyota looking at recycled materials, this is not a joke. We had to replace a screw on our um, injection molding machine in our building because when we were processing some recycled material, there were pieces of screws in the recycled material. Screws, there were pieces of pallets, um, so th th we had a, a screw go into our screw and jam it up in a way to replace the screw. So that's no longer the case for most of the materials that the auto industry is looking at. Okay, key points of recycled material development. There are five. Um, there's actually more, but first, we have to meet Toyota's requirements. So there are some OEMs that historically uh, had a separate specification for recycled materials. Actually, Ford is a good case where um, when the big push for recycled material happened, Ford released specifications that said recycled material. And the properties may have been different, they may have been the same. But since then, Ford has actually, to my knowledge, eliminated those not the only one. Um, Toyota has this dream art contest every year. People all over the world can draw what they envision the future of cars to be. And I found this one. Um, this is from 2014, and this is obviously uh, a child's concept of what a future car will be, taking all this stuff, a uh, car being fueled by glass, metal, paper, plastic, and uh, cleaning the environment at the same time. So it's kind of a neat way to start. I'm talking about four things. What is Toyota's motivation to do this? Um, what are we doing for recycled materials? Third, I'm going to show you a video about easy to dismantle design, and I'm going to summarize, of course. This is something that we see around our office. I think it's kind of one of those corporate pictures that probably took a huge amount of time for somebody to develop, but I want to summarize it for you. So Toyota believes that uh, it's important to have a strong base of business, which is kind of the trunk of this tree. What that means is we need to be profitable in the long term, right? At the same time, having that stable base does no good unless we can grow these fruits on our tree. These fruits on our tree are what we call always better cars and then enriching lives and communities. So at no time do we want to wait too heavily to growing fruit or do we want to wait too heavily on growing this tree. So ultimately, we always go back to our roots, the Toyota uh, principles, the Toyota way um, to help us grow our business sustainably and to continue to provide for society. All right, I'm going to talk about the 2015 recycling vision. Why am I talking about that? It's 2017, I know. This was established in 2003. This is kind of some background. Um, for those of you who have seen me speak before, this used to be what I would say, oh, this is coming in 2015. Well, the good news is um, it is achieved. So I do want to point out that this is a goal that was there in place when I started at Toyota. And we wanted to realize a 95% vehicle risk recovery rate. And we wanted to do a lot of other things. So including things like using recycled materials and using renewable resources at the bottom. So achieved. So after that ended, um, there are next steps. There is something called the Six Toyota Environmental Action Plan. That's happening right now. So it started in uh, fiscal year 16 and it's going through 2020. But there's more beyond that as well. 
This is all going into what we're corporately calling the Toyota Environmental Challenge 2050. There are some pretty lofty goals for 2050. This is, I'm sure you can read it because I can, um, 26 individual activities that are to be implemented during this four year period in order to accomplish and move towards this Environmental Challenge 2050. I know you can't see this either, but there are six goals of the Environmental Challenge 2050. A lot of them have to do with zero net CO2 emissions. So whether it be zero net CO2 during a production of a vehicle, driving the vehicle, end of life of the vehicle, um, or things like water conservation during manufacturing of the vehicle. And then number six is just challenge of establishing, establishing a future society in harmony with nature. I like that one. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of these today. The first is number three, promote environmental management and product development. All right, this is small, I'm gonna go through this in a second. So what do we do when we're making a car and how do we focus on the environment during the design and development of a car? So about five years before a car comes out, we have you know, big meetings with chief engineers and our designers and uh, studios about people who don't wanna have the car fly. And basically we all sit down together and say, who's the demographic of this car? What do we want this car to do? Is it a fast car or is it a family car? Um, but ultimately one of the considerations is always balancing environmental performance. So we look at the customer need, but at every stage of the design and the concept, we're also considering how is this car gonna impact the environment? So fortunately at Toyota, we have a pretty large portfolio of hybrid vehicles, but obviously hybrids are not the end game, right? There's a lot of other things that are being considered now, like electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. So all of these things are taken into consideration during the design of the vehicle. The next stage is two to three years, let's say, before a vehicle hits the road. This is the design and prototyping phase. So we've already had our meetings with the chief engineers. Um, the, there's agreement about what this car is gonna do, but we start making prototype parts. We start working with our suppliers more aggressively. We have drawings with requirements on them. At this point, we are also heavily involved with making sure that that vehicle has what we need in terms of uh, environmental impact. And then finally, just before the start of production, we have a final verification. So this is something as simple as, for example, checking full vehicle VOCs, check for volatile, volatile organic compounds. Make sure that that information is available to our customers and to the public from a, from a sustainability standpoint um, and from a, a, a transparency standpoint. So one of the things that I like, and every couple of years I remember to look at this, um, is our toyotaglobal.com sustainability. All of our sustainability reports are available for anybody to look at. You don't have to have bought a Toyota. So next, I'm gonna talk about uh, recycled resin because that's what we're here for. Um, this is number 10, reduce consumption of dwindling natural resources through use of renewable resources and recycled material. For years at Toyota, all I did was, well, not all I did, one of my main jobs was working on um, renewable content materials. So I looked at all sorts of, um, I appreciated the slide with the jute and the hemp and the soy and the castor. Those are all materials that are kind of industry wide now. I've also looked at recycled materials pretty extensively. So I'm not gonna cover the renewables at all in this presentation. If you have any questions, obviously ask me afterwards. I thought what I would do is talk about two personal case studies of parts that I personally worked on for recycled materials to kind of give you an idea about, um, if you were here in the last session or you were even here just five minutes ago, um, you heard how good the story is for recycled material, right? We're hearing that the quality is good and the price is good. So why aren't recycled materials being used for everything? Well, here's two case studies. All right, it's a good, in, good candidate part. It's interior, uh, so maybe the weathering requirement is quite as much. It's hidden, so we often hear in the recycled world that black is black. Um, well, I can tell you that black is not black, um, but this part was hidden, so black could be black for this. It could be a slightly different black than Toyota's 201B, which is our color code for our interior. It's currently an unfilled polypropylene. Um, with unfilled polypropylenes, there's a huge availability of recycled materials. Great news is there was 10 cents per vehicle savings. So why did I not do this? Well, there was a mass increase of 7%. So we looked at the huge portfolio of recycled materials that were available. At the time, we couldn't find any that gave us a, a mass neutral solution. Why is that happening? Because when you're looking at recycled materials, it's infrequent, especially with polypropylene, that you have a single stream source of raw material. 
So what happens is the compounders are taking your yogurt cups and your uh, laundry baskets and your laundry tubs and all these other types of plastics, automotive parts, blending them together. The color is off, so they add carbon black, or the properties are off, so they add more talc. They might add calcium. All of that increases the density of the material. So unfortunately, at Toyota, we have a policy that we shouldn't be increasing mass. Case number two, another good candidate part. This is also interior. Uh, this is TPO. So Sue talked about TPOs earlier. Uh, TPOs are more expensive than polypropylene. This is a customer touch surface, which I want to point out only because we kind of like the story of customers being able to get in contact with the material. So if we say this is a recycled instrument panel, the customer can touch it and, and feel at one with the recycled instrument panel. This is even aw more awesome than previously, right? So we've got almost a dollar savings per vehicle. So what happened? Well, what happened was the part had to have virgin properties. Um, it was the safety part. So this safety part, when we go to a designer or to a chief engineer, they say, well, lot to lot consistency is absolutely critical to this part. We have to go to the government and say, we are confident that this part will perform the exact same way every single time. So um, at Toyota, there's a Japanese word, baratsuki, means variability. And whenever I start talking to my colleagues in Japan about um, recycled material, they always say, how's the baratsuki? <laughs> how's the variability? How's the lot to lot variability? And I appreciated you mentioning KW. Because KW is not just a battery recycler um, that has some plastic. They are a gigantic recycler. Um, the first time I went to KW, I expected to see you know, a mom and pop shop with you know, a few little silos. But we are talking massive, massive, massive. It, takes, it would take you half an hour to walk around these things type of silos. They're putting more plastic through their facility than a lot of our automotive compounders are. So when you talk lots to lot variability, I think Sue mentioned the same thing this morning, that you know, ultimately you have raw materials coming in, whether it be petroleum or ethylene or now natural gas that's being cracked. Um, you have a raw material. And when you're dealing with that much volume and that much bulk, the variability starts to become less of a story. But there's still an issue of convincing the industry that recycled material doesn't have this issue. So when we talk about safety parts, there is a perception that exists that recycled material is no good. When I first started at, at Toyota looking at recycled materials, this is not a joke. We had to replace a screw on our um, injection molding machine in our building because when we were processing some recycled material, there were pieces of screws in the recycled material. Screws, there were pieces of pallets, um, so we had a, a screw go into our screw and jam it up in a way to replace the screw. So that's no longer the case for most of the materials that the auto industry is looking at. Okay, key points of recycled material development. There are five. Um, there's actually more, but first, we have to meet Toyota's requirements. So there are some OEMs that historically uh, had a separate specification for recycled materials. Actually, Ford is a good case where um, when the big push for recycled material happened, Ford released specifications that said recycled material. And the properties may have been different, they may have been the same. But since then, Ford has actually, to my knowledge, eliminated those specifications. And everything is just a specification now. So from a Toyota perspective, when we receive a material, whether it be recycled or virgin, it has to meet the same requirements. So that's actually a good thing from my perspective because that gives us the freedom to go to our major part suppliers and say to them, as long as you're meeting the requirements, you can use recycled material. The second thing is, if we're doing a running change, meaning this is um, a Camry glove box, and during the life cycle of the Camry, whether it be five years or eight years, specifications, and everything is just a specification now, um, we want to introduce a recycled material you have to have the same processability as you did with the virgin. So for example, flow rate, shrinkage, um, those are things that if you don't meet the virgin material, you're going to have issues in processing and in part shrinkage and, and fit and finish. The third is colored resin must be the same master colors other interior parts, even if it's black. So I'm involved with a big project at Toyota right now. It's changing from 201B to 202B. From a customer perspective, you're never going to notice the difference between this black and this black. But a lot of people 
spend a lot of time making sure that black is black. So uh, we want to be really careful with, with the coloration of recycled materials. Fourth, I beat this to death already, so we're not going to talk about that. Number five is strong and consistent supply. So had I given this presentation five years ago, that probably wouldn't have been on there uh, because we were so worried about the material not meeting specifications, and there were so few examples of material meeting our specifications that we didn't have to worry about it. We would just say, it doesn't meet the spec, so you're not gonna, we're not going to use recycled material for this part. Since then, there's a lot of materials that do meet our spec. So now the challenge is, can we use it consistently and with a strong supply base? So here's an example. Um, we produce two million vehicles, roughly, in the United States every year. Uh, we say that there's about 10 pounds of resin in your front and rear bumper combined. That's 20 million pounds of TPO. So granted, we don't want to use 100% recycled for bumpers, but just as an example, we're talking huge volumes of material. So what we don't want to have happen is for us to be in the middle of a program and for a supplier to say, our contract with somebody ran out. We can't supply you the material that we previously qualified. So when we look at a KW, for example, they may have enough volume that that would never be a concern for us. But a lot of recyclers and compounders still struggle to understand that we can't have just a very, very small scale business and write a specification or create a part based on that material unless we are confident that it's going to be strong and consistent supply. Good news is, if we can achieve these points, we can use recycled materials. All right, so this is, this is kind of a uh, silly slide. Um, just kind of showing some of the work that we're doing, right? So in, the, in a car, there's a ton of different materials, um, and it's getting more and more so every day, right? There's multi-material vehicles, we're calling them, right? There's unfilled polypropylene, there's high impact, there's high heat resistant TPOs, there's also um, composite materials, like glass fiber materials. So all of these are just examples of polypropylene. All of these materials have different applications that we're looking at. So there's no one material that we can say, oh good, we found a material from, oh, let's pick on KW, we found a material from KW, we can use it everywhere in the car. That's just not how it works, unfortunately. But we are challenging ourselves continuously to find more parts, find more applications, find more materials for our vehicles. All right. Um, I have very little confidence that this is going to work, but I do have a short video. Um, we're getting on to number 11 here, which is achieve industry leading level and easy to dismantle design for effective resource recovery. So the idea here is that as a manufacturer, we need to facilitate the recycling of materials that we're using. So let's say you have a door trim in a vehicle, you know, where you rest your arm. That's probably, at minimum, two layers of material. And in a luxury vehicle, might be four or five layers of material. Historically, those were glued together. Glued together, mechanical fasteners, uh, staples. Um, they were vibration welded, so that nearly impossible to separate. So Toyota recognized this issue because our end-of-life vehicle dismantlers were saying, we can't do anything with this. This just goes to the landfill because we can't recover these things. So, so I started to work on this uh, concept of dismantleability. Um, what you can see, I don't know if this mouse show up, no. Anyway, down on the bottom right, you can see a little symbol in the green box. And Toyota started to incorporate this symbol in our vehicles. And that symbol is an indicator of where a point that makes the vehicle easy to dismantle might be. So I have a video um, that some people in this room have seen before. I just want to let you know that if you're tired of hearing uh, from me, I did narrate this video. Um, so, you're going to have to hear more of me. Let's see if it works. Okay, hang on. All right, you can't see this, so let's see if I drag it over. Yeah. All right, hang on. I saw a presentation yesterday about millennials and how good they are with technology, but... Um, all right, well, let's see. Where are we? <laughs> Where's my mouse? Hang on, I'm trying to find a mouse. Oh, oh, there we go. This is really not very convenient to look at this way. Okay, here we go.
Toyota promotes reduce, reuse, and recycle, or 3R initiatives, through the entire life cycle of a vehicle, from the development to end of life stages. In the development stage of new vehicles, Toyota, assuming the working process of a dismantling company, applies easy to dismantle structures to vehicle designing in order to make the dismantling and recycling process easy. That's not me. I do have one of those jackets though. With the wide use of heavy industrial machines by dismantling companies, Toyota conducts, using such machines, dismantability evaluation for over 90 items. That's the entire wire harness out of a vehicle. To enable this, easy to dismantle designs are fully utilized in the actual dismantle process. Toyota has settled easy to dismantle marks. For example, if you drill this point of a fuel tank, you can easily pull out all of the remaining fuel. If you tear out wiring harnesses by a heavy industrial machine from this point, you can take the whole ones without breaking off. And this pull tab type grounding terminal is adopted to facilitate pulling out wiring harness easily. As a result, it has now become easier to dismantle Toyota vehicles. Even for automobile parts invisible from customers, Toyota tries to incorporate into them structures easy to dismantle effectively. In this way, Toyota will further promote vehicle recycling. Okay, so I apologize for the way that video uh Hurt your ears. Okay, so um, the key point there obviously is that you know we are working on helping you all help us. So we really want to make sure that when we're building a vehicle, we're keeping end of life in mind. All right, summarize. Um, this is kind of the flow chart of, of what a vehicle does, right? So we have development, production, use, and then disposal of the vehicle. So really bringing that disposal back into development is what we just saw as the easy to dismantle idea. So what I talked about was our motivation, why we're doing this, um, how we achieve a production uh, vehicle with uh, more than 20% of the total mass being derived from eco-plastic or recycled materials. And also I talked about easing material separation and the vehicle life. What I didn't discuss were any of the other kinds of action items that make up our six environmental target action plans. Um, you can read about those if you want. Uh, there's also a link to more videos that talk about some additional things um, there on the bottom of the previous slide. So a final thought is that, you know, though environmental flagship vehicles are huge steps forward, there is still a lot of work to be done. So I always, every time I present or talk to suppliers, I say, you know, I need to challenge you create unique and innovative solutions to increase the use of recycled materials, um, ultimately lowering carbon footprint and increasing value. Increasing value to Toyota, to our suppliers, and most importantly to society. Thank you very much. I can answer questions now or later. Later? Yeah. Is it okay to ask questions now?
other materials to say, and that's not the way. So the plastic makes you worldwide have nothing in common. Nothing of the common. I give you example after example after example of recycled paper and broadly available that people are not tapping into. So I, I agree with the conclusion that we in the plastics industry don't do a very good job, frankly, taking advantage of the opportunities that are right in front of us. Uh, and that strikes me as very strange. Whereas you do it in metals and polymers, it's almost actually never done. As a percent of the weight savings that's available, it's almost never done at all. Yeah. I find that, that dichotomy extremely strange. Comments? So Your insight. You know, I'm not an, I'm certainly not an expert on metals. I, I do know that, you know, that's obviously one of the things that's most recycled in, in our I mean, there, there are still only automobiles that have been recycled for a very long time with an incredibly high rate of I think uh, part of the challenge for plastic is level B. Of people perceiving recycled plastics as being inferior quality. And I also think it's quite frankly the the cost delta. So part of that has to do with the legacy as well. When you talk about steel, you can achieve exactly the same properties after it's been recycled. I mean exact same properties. With recycled there's always there may be some like Steve talked about earlier, you may have to recompound an additive that you degrade it slightly. You may have a small mass increase. You may have a slightly different thing. But the virgin material, virgin plastic, probably pulls in insanely cheap right now in North America, right? It's the cheapest in North America anywhere globally uh, because of our sales act. So when a designer chooses between a material that's one or two cents less expensive to recycle, they're also weighing their perceived risk of using that recycled material, right? Well, we know that, you know, Exxon or Bechdel uh, produces the exact same reactive grade polypropylene for millions and millions of pounds, year after year after year, the grade has never changed. Are we really risking bloody the risk for one cent a pound to go to the recycled material? And then unfortunately, the legacy aspect comes in where somebody says, ah, it's just not worth it to us. So that's where we're gonna need champions of sustainability to say, let's take the risk, let's move on with this, um, and prove that it works. Because more applications that have it, that legacy is gonna get more and more dangerous. I mean, that's maybe the only answer I can give is that that delta cost still isn't really enough to get people to, to take the chance. You got to give your question. Yes, please. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Ivan Tarahomi. Uh, he's currently Director of R&D and Process Engineering at Mitsubishi Chemical Performance Polymers in Warren, Michigan. I'm not gonna read his whole resume because I use up about 15 minutes. But uh, Dr. Tarahomi has 15 patents alone in the United States. Uh, Ivan, you ready? I'm probably gonna need to unpin a lot of my stuff. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Sasan Terahomi, very nice introduction. Thank you for not reading the whole thing. Uh, you think why a guy in a Mitsubishi chemical want to talk about recycling? Guys, this is, this is uh, something that I love. And, and when I uh, came to automotive and plastic, I said, we need to recycle. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. I've got a very long presentation. So I'm going to cover some of the facts. Many of you heard some of these, but I really need to talk about this. Players in the industry, planning, who is the ARA, BMW disassembly, uh, Andy's presentation and Eric's presentation really worked well. I didn't know what you guys were talking about, but this is exactly um, connecting to what you were talking about. I mean, I, I wish I knew, but it, excellent presentation, great job. And government engagement, automotive industry, material approval process. This is what material approval process is, so I need to cover that. Recycling approach to plastics, a quick summary. So a lot of pages in here, I'm gonna go very quick. So this is the overall recycling that you see in the US of everything we do. 16% plastics, a lot of fibers, metals, but this is everything that we do, correct? Just, just remember the numbers. So 4 million vehicles that recycle, this is the ARA, Automotive Recycler Association 2016 data. So just remember that. Going through this, each year recycling industry, when they, this is their data. So 86% of material recycled in the vehicle, 
8 million gallons of engine coolants, 24 million gallons of oil, 96% lead acid batteries, 8 million of diesel fuel, 5 million gallons of windshield washer fluid. This is their data. What the heck is plastic? I tell you guys, I spend a lot of time looking at this thing. I mean, I, I'm in automotive, I'm in plastics. They don't even list it in there. Shame on them. I know they're here. Any of you guys ARA member? I don't know. They told me they're here anyway. I, I have to talk about this. This is, we need to talk about this issue anyway. Auto dismantling in North America, very bad, horrible. Excellent presentation on what you guys are working on, but this is what the life is. It's basically junkyard. That's what people see in auto recycling. And disorganized, and not a really good way to do this. Still extremely cost effective to landfill. In Michigan, I love Michigan. I tell you, I lived in a lot of different states. We bring garbage from Canada to Michigan because it's cheap to landfill. So as long as landfill is cheap, we're going to keep doing this thing. So it's a business case. So this is a ranking that's really bothered me. I tell you, US, we're doing a lot of great stuff. Everybody want to come in here. They want to do a lot of things. We are number 18. Canada is number 25. Embarrassing, guys. This is really all of us. We really got to take the lead on this thing. Players in industry, this is where it really also gets it very complex. Government, OEM, consumers, repair shop, the dismantling operation. Basically, these are the junkyard guys working on things. Recycling industry, a lot of us, compounders, additive recycling equipment manufacturers. So extremely complex. And you know what? Everybody got to make money. We, this is not a church. We, have, we are in the business to make profit. So how do we do this? It's a business case. I did call a couple of these ARA members, board members. I did. I said, I called them. I want to talk to them. This guy told me I had his name. I took it off. And he said, Susan, I, we have uh, basically jail inmates disassembling car plastic parts. And by the time we do this, this guy's in the East Coast. He said, by the time we get this and we try to recycle it, it still costs us more money. So you know what? It's cheaper to send it to the incinerators. So he said, you know, the Midwest guys, they do that. But us, we can't do that transportation cost. There's no system. The business is really broken. This guy said, if a guy in a town with a free labor can't do this, who can do this? This is terrible. So anyway. This is a lot of reading. All I want to say is 1,000 members direct, 2,000 affiliate members, 12 countries, been since 1943. They are in the wrong business. Get rid of them or change your thinking. Your ARA, Automotive Recycling Association, you're not doing the right thing. We need to set the pace. So this is really I'm very harsh, but guys, this is what they think of. Recycling in US means take the part, sell it to the next guy, not to tear it down and disassemble and get it back to the piece. This is really, this is in their website. So take a part that is a 400 or 750 bucks. I can sell it for 150. So this is how they're basically dismantling and selling the components. They're not thinking about recycling. So this is uh, some of the key issues they talk about. I really like this. They did say the key issues, salvage vehicle acquisition. The end-of-life vehicle management. Those are the two key things that are really close that I see. We need to change in this country. The rest of them, you know, it's a various other things in here that they talk about. And then this is a really good website. I wanted to bring the video. This is a 20 minutes. I didn't do it. You go to uh, YouTube and watch it. This is incredibly nice. I took the 20 minutes, I kind of bullet point there. Dedicated disassembly center. Vehicles are tagged. And um, let me see in here. And then uh, all airbags deployed. It was a, you know, this is incredible. They, they do all these as a clockwork. Fluids drained, plastic part disassembled, catalytic converter is cut and removed, engine torn out. This, this big machine, just like what you guys showed, tear the engine out and totally recycle different metals and the bodies. So this entire thing, it looked like a dealership. It's a beautiful facility. It didn't look like a junkyard. And it was extremely, and you know what impressive was? The cars that they were tearing out. These are beautiful cars. BMWs and Daimlers that if you see in here, they put them in the road. They don't tear them out. They do that in Europe. So this is why it's a business case. That that's, it's, it's a lot of things behind it. We'll talk a little more. So the government regulations has got to be there. We need to mandate the use of recycling and increase this consistently. 
It happens in Germany, it happens in other countries because they support it, they force it, you must do it. We don't have it in here. And then uh, it's got to be an incentive for everybody in OEM to use it. And Eric mentioned that it's got to be lower cost. It's got to be beneficial for everybody. You can't just bring it in and tell the guys you're going to use this, but at a higher cost. So uh, common question, you get into the material approval. Who needs approval? Why do we need it? When do we need it? How long does it take? I, I did this thing in Shanghai just uh, back in March. I'll tell you, well, it was, it was incredible because it was so new there. These guys, they all needed it, but I kind of use this very similar type of thing. Why we need approval? Basically, requirement. If you want to be in automotive, you got to have it. So don't question it. Do it. Who needs it? Everybody. Your tier one, your resin supplier, recyclers, you got to have it. Don't bring the resin to the guys and say, I got it, but I don't have the approval. It's got to be there. Uh, when do I need to start? Any time. The sooner, the better. So it takes time. How long does it take? And depends on how critical the resin and OEM, uh, you, they need this thing. I, there was a cases that I did get the approval in a week, but sometimes it may take a year. Sometimes, you know, three months is as fast as I've seen in some of the cases. Who can help? Oh, this is great. Uh, Eric Canal should be your best friend. Get his business card. If you want to deal, get all the material engineer at OEM. You need to get these guys, become their best friends, and, and know them. How do we start the process? Well, there's a lot of stuff. Basically, you got to talk to these guys, get their specific application, and there's a lot of different things. And it starts with the material engineer group at OEM. And then uh, material run for approval. Lot size is critical. You got to do this. Again, I heard this thing, uh, Eric mentioned, uh, several people have mentioned this, and Sue mentioned it. You're treating this just like a virgin resin. Don't treat it like a recycler. One of the problems I see with OEM, I, I dealt with Ford a lot, at, at Ford was my customer, and later on everybody OEM globally. But the thing is, the problem is, majority, I would say probably 90% of engineers at the OEM, they're mechanical engineers. My bachelor is mechanical engineers. I'll tell you guys, I have no clue about polymers. And these guys are scared. Polymers, time, temperature changes it. Steel doesn't. So steel is predictive. And these guys are scared you're talking about. Oh, I want to change your front end module. I did that before. Bazillions of them back in 90s and 80s. So, but the thing is, you had to breed data. Show them with data and convince them. So this a lot size is very critical, just like a virgin resin. Uh, production equipment and facility you've got to be used, production processing parameters, uh, trained production employees, and then uh, just like everything else, your APQP, process female control plan. Uh, a lot of the recyclers are strange in these things. So you've got to train them, and we do. As a tier one, I was tier one, I was doing this thing, but this is, this is a key thing that I think scares the OEM and tier one to use recycled resin. Test to specification, this is very important. So test plan template from OEM. This is all developed, get those things. You gotta run six lots. The lots maybe 10,000 pound, 50,000 pound, do those things. And test all of those to the templates and use a plus or minus three sigma. A lot of people don't understand this thing. Don't give me an average number. It's statistically speak. Every time you speak to a data, make sure it's statistically correct. Plus or minus three sigma, we talk about six sigma, it's automotive. If you wanna be automotive, you gotta talk to this. If you don't wanna know, know the language, you're out of the area. Compile this thing and then discuss it with them. I tell you, you do this, you get the approval. And that's really the issue. This is what I've done. I, I created a table and I actually sent it to all the guys who doesn't understand this. Very simple, you get this thing and, and bam, you know, you get the whole result done. So uh, I wanna talk about a little bit of different OEMs. Ford, GM, FCA, these are typical, traditional big three. These guys, application base approval, OEM uh, approves the material, they get it into their database, tier one sponsors them, and you gotta submit the data and approval and go through the uh, trial. So this is the steps for a typical, uh, old, traditional big three. This is the kind of letter, I wrote many of these things, and my colleague Sue at IEC, and, uh, did many of these as well, but you, you, gotta, you gotta have start with the sponsorship letter. And then this is the table that I was talking about. This is the FCA table, and basically a couple of pages. It tells you what it is, and once finals, and then you get signature, you plug all this stuff, but look at all this data in here. All the OEM, they talk about this. You gotta have this thing. So, uh, and then go forward, and then uh, the additional stuff. This is a critical thing, guys. Not just think about the data, they're doing simulation. 
Actually, Ford wants to, the goal is 100% of vehicle designed to be by simulation. That means when you submit the stuff, you start getting the tensile stress data, Poisson ratio, stuff that needs for the CAE guys. So you're another level above. You've got to have all these data. And a lot of these are missing from recycled resins. And, you know, and you got to do those things if you want to get in there. So FCA, other data, this is very similar. And, you know, and if uh, you, know, you, you need a, to know some of these details, you can contact me. And I can get you guys some of this info. And then, and then once they get it, it goes into the database. So FCA enters it, you got the material approval, I kind of made this a little small. It's right on here is your approvals. And then uh, German OEM is a little different. German OEM, they don't have an approval similar to the traditional big three. You gotta talk to them, they have their own list. I call it the application and property based approval. They uh, OEM, you gotta talk to them, they look at your material, they test it, they test it. And then once they approve it, they get into their system and then they what they do is they uh, put those things in a certain specification and then and then they approve you for use for those applications i'll go through this a little bit so like this uh, basically here the identified you know material in here and it tells you the description and ap application examples and then they have more detail that you know you, you got to be working on and then a lot of their testing is a din testing the Germans, and many of them, if you want to work with Germany, you've got to get all the parts to German, uh, basically into Germany to, to their lab. Sometimes it's very difficult. They don't approve a lot of the labs we have global. So we had a difficulty at, at, at once I was at IEC, send a lot of parts to Germany. Cost a lot of money, a lot of work. And then uh, once it's done, this is, this is their typical, and uh, basically you'll see they have all the properties, and then they tell you basically various things and, and what needs to be for those uh, materials and, and tables. And then if you fit that area, and this is already done ahead of time. And but one other thing is, uh, let me, if I have it in here or not, let me, one other thing is with Germans is uh, they're also, once they approve it, they continuously will test it. You're not done. They actually give you a grade. I dealt with one of them with a big application. So son, you receive a C grade. You gotta improve it to A grade. Every quarter used to call me. So it's a continuous testing. So they take the parts out of the line and they test it themselves. And so once you are working with a German OEM, you're working with life for the rest of your life, you gotta improve. So this is incredible. I've never seen anybody else that does so much effort into it. Asian OEMs, and now I'm working for an Asian company, it's a totally new way, new things for me, but these are a little bit similar to the Germans. But one of the things I learned, actually Toyota, I really need to speak about this because I had cases that I had to do testing and uh, what I looked at is uh, all the testing across the board global. One of the things Toyota is the best than any other OEM, they test parts to failure. And once the test is part, uh, identified to failure, then they lower that limit. So you know the threshold and limit. So a lot of our tests at OEM, and I asked this GM, I asked this at Ford, I asked this at Daimler, how did you come up with this test? I mean, I tell you, some of the Germans are notorious. These tests are like a kilonewtons. You were talking about newtons, they talk about kilonewtons on the same components. How did you come up with this test? They don't have anything to back it up. Some of the chief engineers tell me, oh, we developed that back in 1940. I said, sorry, you didn't have polypropylene on a door in 1940. You got it right now. You gotta come up with a better reason. So Toyota actually tests these things to failure and understand what it is by the statistical data, they lower it to an acceptable level they have to pass. And a continuous improvement, and if they need to, they raise the bar again. But all the other OEM, they test to a level. Some is good, but I, I really had a tough time with the Germans on this thing. So the application-based, property-based approval, very similar. And a lot of the steps are very similar to the rest of the team in there. I apologize, I'm going real fast. I know we're tight in timing. And then the specific materials, I just took this off of one of the Japanese OEM, the same thing, identify the class, the material, composition, and application. If your material fits in this, then you're the guy that can do that for them. And obviously, tier one looks at those things and gives you the, gives you the go ahead to start. And then they identify their test for those applications and tell you what those things are. These are all test bases. And then you come into the characteristics for their material and they tell you if, for example, your material fits in, in this, uh, let me see, oh, sorry, in this category, basically, right in here, is a polypropylene talc, 20%, it's called IC2U1, then you gotta meet these specifications, very simple. 
Now, design challenges, Eric brought this up, really important. Plastic parts are not designed for disassembly. Shame on tier ones, OEMs, we gotta do a hell of a lot better. I'm talking about design the entire door out of one material. Get all the steel out. You know why? I told this to the younger kids, just uh, I did a speech in a, for, for, the, for the middle schoolers, and, and I think college kids, and a lot of those guys are gone, but I mean, they're, they're really, their mindset is different. You gotta work on the kindergarten and, and, and first graders and those things. I told them, you know, Boeing, 2015, the Dreamliner, over 50% plastics and composite, including the hardware and the engine. Why are we still stuck with the 10% in the car? I mean, we'd be talking about, I'm lucky if we get a, I just did a quick calculation, you know, maybe we're lucky if 500 pounds out of a 5,000 pound car is plastics, mostly around 250, 300. We talk about it, we never do it. The steel, and, and, and again, because of a lot of reasons, I just explained some of those things, but I trust to sit in a Boeing and go in there. I'd be able to, should be able to trust the car that much. The similar material is problem. We do have uh, polyester, and, 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 and uh, Sue can attest to this, polyester and a urethane and olefin. What the hell, that poor guy in a recycler's gun? First of all, he doesn't know the difference on the melting on all of these. A lot of these guys have got the thing, you wanna do a business, very difficult. Well, a lot, right now, they're getting smarter, they're hiring chemists, they're hiring a lot of PhDs to do the things. But we should design, we should design out of one material for a component. You do door assembly, IP assembly, all olefinic. So you can tear it. Get rid of all the fasteners. We have the ability to design the snap fit. Look at the Boeings, they're doing it. So why can't we do it in the car? And then uh, promote design for recyclability, basically overall, and, and, and then initiate the approval. And uh, this is a difficult one. I know we talk about it, but it's a hell of a job to get approval from OEM. With all due respect to my colleagues in from Ford and Toyota, but it is difficult. So, and, and as I said, because not all the cases I just said earlier, is a business case. You have to make money, unless, you know, you, you offer a, a big savings, and you be green and all these other things, and mass. I always said, you know, it's a, it's a tripod. It's a performance base, cost base, and density based. So t take a look at those three. Plug those in and, and make a cube and put those three properties, and then if you win on those three properties, the OEM will definitely will talk to you. And then a challenge for the tier one producer components, again, to recycle, again, because of those issues. So it is really very challenging. The way I see it is this is how it is in industry right now. I tell you guys, I've, I've been seeing this thing last 20 years, hasn't changed. On, on, on the left side, you see that system. Recycle guys on the other side. They're not even in the area. I don't know why, but this is what we need to do. We gotta treat these guys like a virgin resin compounder, like, like Mitsubishi polymer. So they, they treat them like a second class citizen and they're not even in the, in the area. I think this has got to change the mindset and I think before we do anything. So in a summary, a better organized recycling dismantling system is needed in North America. We don't have it. OEM tier one components, uh, recyclability in mind is a critical. And OEM to approve a lot more resin faster, quicker. And then plastic recycling industry to get a lot more familiar with the OEM material approval process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, I'm uh, Derek Reed. Um, I work with uh, Padnos uh, Plastics Division. Um, I've been uh, supplying at one company or another uh, to the automotive industry for approximately 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, 15, 16 years of that have been uh, with in, in plastics. Um, all of that time, I've uh, I've spent working on automotive approvals. So um, I want to uh, kind of show you the resin supplier's perspective. If I can make it 
work. Did you? <laughs> All right, there we go. We have action. Uh, so we're just going to look at who, what, why, how. Um, I'm going to move through quickly. A lot of this information has been covered. Um, Sasan did a great job. Um, this is just uh, you know, a view of you know, what the uh, automotive supply chain looks like. Um, we as resin suppliers find ourselves you know, sort of at the bottom. However, with approvals, um, we're not necessarily having to work our way up through the chain. Um, in my experience, quite often, um, you're working directly either with the Tier 1 or the OEM materials engineer uh, in order to um, achieve your automotive approval. Um, so whose support do you need to begin uh, work on, on uh, automotive specification approval? Um, so you're going uh, to need the support of uh, your, I'm sorry. You're going, to, uh, you're going to need the support of uh, molders, okay, um, or, uh, or uh, materials engineers, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm lost here. Okay. So molders, tier one auto suppliers, and uh, OEMs. Um, within the OEMs though, however, um, we're looking at uh, definitely needing buy-in from uh, all three of purchasing, uh, engineering, and materials. If you don't have buy-in from all three of those, um, you're, uh, you're going to have a hard road. So, who can get material approved? Um, typically, uh, OEMs are looking for manufacturers. Uh, they want to work with manufacturers, although um, I do have quite a bit of experience in uh, working on automotive, automotive approvals through, um, you know, as a, as a resin distributor, um, it is possible. Uh, who approves plastic materials at OEMs? Um, it's definitely uh, the materials engineer, as Hassan mentioned before. Um, do all automotive OEMs use approved materials lists? No. Um, you know, GM Ford Chrysler does. Um, there are several uh, offshore, uh, OEMs that do, but uh, definitely um, all of them have their own individual process. Um, <clears throat> what does it mean to have an automotive approval in plastics? Okay, um, definitely what you're doing with an automotive approval is is you're showing proof that your resin meets the material specification requirements uh, of a given uh, uh, of a given part. Um, also, your material can be used for new part design if you have an automotive approval. Um, your material can be used by molders uh, to cost for future programs, and your material can be specified on the part print. Why do you want an automotive approval in plastics? Well, of course, uh, the large volumes in automotive um, are, are the reason you want the automotive approval. Um, it, it's just going to increase your sales. Also, without it, uh, part suppliers are not authorized to use your product. Why does the OEM want you, uh, want to grant you the automotive approval? Well, again, they want to be sure that you meet the specifications. Um, but uh, they're also looking for things like quality improvements, engineering improvements, um, for example, light weighting, um, impact improvements, um, so on and so forth. But in general, the main reason, from my experience, is a cost save. They're looking for a cost save. So the types of approvals I have experience with, um, definitely um, there's the specification approval listing, uh, where you're getting um, your material approved, it gets put on a list, uh, engineers can choose from that list uh, to use your material. Uh, there's also uh, something popular with Ford, a uh, co-managed by situation, where uh, you're getting approved as a co-managed by partner. Um, the OEM is actually uh, negotiating directly with the resin supplier the price of the material, and then that is then dictated to the, the uh, part suppliers and molders. Um, and also you can get a print approval. 
Um, there are certain situations where uh, you may get your material approved, and they're just going to write the name of your material right on the print. Okay. So what are some of the activities that happen uh, while you're working on a material approval? Uh, of course, materials testing, as uh, Sasan uh, went through with us. Um, definitely need approval from engineering. When, and when I say engineering, I, I don't mean the materials engineer. I mean, I mean the, uh, the engineers of, uh, of components. Um, you're going to have to go through molding trials. Um, once we know that your material uh, meets all the specification requirements, uh, the molder's going to want to try it out, right? They're going to want to put it in their machine and make sure it run, makes good parts. After the molding trials are completed, um, you have uh, part functional appearance approval. Um, you need to get those signed off. Uh, then you're going to get approval, hopefully, from purchasing. And finally, you're signed off from the materials engineer. Um, just to summarize, I want to uh, you know, just make three, three main points. So um, automotive ma uh, material approvals uh, are going to lead to increased sales volume. That's why you want to get one, right? Um, so automotive supply chain will be motivated to work with you uh, if you show them uh, quality engineering and, again, most importantly, cost save. Whoops. Lost it. <clears throat> anyway, my final point was that definitely you have to make sure you have buy-in from purchasing from materials and from, and from the engineers, right? So you need those three. Um, otherwise, you're going nowhere. Thank you.